Okay, so we're going to continue. Let's pray first, no? Just thank you, Lord Jesus, for the reminder that we are chosen, it's not by our merit, but by your grace. And thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here with us this morning. Now speak to us afresh, we pray. Grant us fresh vision. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we were we've been doing John chapter 20, Resurrection Appearances. Yesterday we saw Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. And what was the priority that we focused on there? That we thought Jesus was emphasizing? Yes, anybody? The new. Nice guess, but no, that's not what I said. Oh, spiritual intimacy. Spiritual intimacy. It's always the new. So it's, you can never go wrong when you say that Jesus was focusing on the new. So we go on to John, John chapter 20, actually. It's 19. Spiritual intimacy. Jairaj, you're a bit late. I already said that. <laughs> but you're right. Okay. So yesterday we did Mary Magdalene in the middle. We missed out the part where the disciples were involved. So John chapter 20, verses 3 to 10. This is the first time that Mary goes to them and tells the disciples. This time she tells them the body is not there. And they've taken away the body. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. The other disciple being John. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Okay, the fact that she goes and we don't know who all were there, but she seems to speak to Peter and John, seems that they were clearly among the leadership of the apostles along with James. And we know that from the incidents where Jesus takes them aside, these three. Okay. The second thing you see from this passage are these eyewitness details, which are so critical to us realizing that this is that this is historical narrative. These are eyewitness details. See how, how, uh, I mean, almost casually, but John describes so many details because those are the things that are imprinted in his memory. That he he reached there first, didn't go, and this thing happened, that thing happened. The description of what was in the tomb, all of that, you know. And it's so in character with Simon Peter that John will hesitate at the at the mouth of the tomb and Simon Peter will go rushing straight in and then John hesitantly follows him. Okay. John describes the grave clothes in such detail because he realized how significant they were. And this is the point. Grave robbers would have taken the body with the grave clothes still wrapped around it. Even if they remove the clothes, they would be scattered in disarray all over the tomb. Okay, so let me read what Barclay writes about this. Then something else struck him. The grave clothes were not disheveled and disarranged. They were lying there still in their folds. This is what the Greek means. The clothes for the body where the clothes for the body where the body had been, the napkin, where the head had lain. The whole point of the description is that the grave clothes did not look as if they had been put off or taken off. They were lying there in their regular folds as if the body of Jesus had simply evaporated out of them. And for example, if you uh, remember the Passion of the Christ, they just showed the clothes, the, the grave clothes collapsing, sort of, you know, as, as if what was inside them comes out. The sight suddenly penetrated to John's mind. He realized what had happened 
and he believed. It was not what he had read in scripture which convinced him that Jesus had risen. It was what he saw with his own eyes. See? So in one sense it is a blot on him that he didn't recognize from scripture or even from what Jesus said. But on the other hand, his faith came through this eyewitness account. Despite all this, as I said yesterday, it seems neither John nor Peter, and we don't know if Peter believed at that moment, were really confident enough to make that belief public. They didn't even talk to Mary and say, Oh, Mary, see, he's raised from the dead. Okay? John says he believed, and yet it was a hidden belief as we will go on to see. There is no indication that there was any belief among the disciples that Jesus had actually risen. Okay. Then we had the story of Mary Magdalene and Jesus meeting Mary and then Mary goes back to the disciples and this time all of them and says that he was risen and that she had seen the Lord and what all he had and we, we saw that it was a very encouraging message that Jesus gave for the disciples. Okay, Verse 19 onward, 19 and 20. On the evening of that first day of the week when the, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. So as I said, this is after Mary Magdalene has come to them again. This is all happening in the morning. Remember Mary Magdalene's first visit was while it was still dark. So early in the morning, all that has happened that we read earlier. She has come to them again early in the morning itself and said that she's seen the Lord. This is now the evening. Okay. They are still not in a place of belief. In the meantime, possibly another woman, maybe two of them have come and spoken to them. Those two guys who went to Emmaus have come back. They are still not in a place of belief. It was likely that they were all together in the upper room. Not just the eleven apart from Thomas, but other disciples as well. Okay. What would have been their state? They would have been fearful, of course, as written there. They were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. They would have been confused, maybe hopeful because they're hearing these, these amazing accounts, but still not really believing. Okay. You can see from various incidents that various uh, other references that they didn't really believe. So, for example, Mark 16 verse 11 says, When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, that's Mary Magdalene, they did not believe it. Okay, so it doesn't look like they fully believed Mary Magdalene or the other women as well. We see in uh, uh, the road to Emmaus, the two disciples, when they're chatting with this person and they don't know if he is Jesus, you know, they, are, they, they actually tell this stranger, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, which was the vision of angels telling them that Jesus had risen, but they did not, but him they did not see. So they already had this information, but before that they say in verse in verse 17 we see that they stood still, their faces downcast. So there is no sense of believing that Jesus has risen from the dead. Okay. So they're together. All this, all these maybe conflicting emotions. I'm sure there's a there's a germ of belief and hope, and we see what of course John said that he believed looking at the state of the grave clothes and then Jesus comes and st stands among them you know there's been the thing that this could have been a miraculous he entered through the clock door but we don't know maybe he just walked in knocked on the door we don't know what happened so there's no need to believe that there was something super, very supernatural about this particular coming in and he says peace be with you okay so his body was obviously a resurrection body yet he still had the wounds from the cross but not, it seems, from the whippings and beatings before. He says, throws him his hands and his side. 
well we know that his whole body would actually have been scarred also if he came with all of that he'd have looked really fearful considering that he was whipped so much that you could see his ribs that would have been the kind of lashing that he had received so he seems to have had a he's got a restored body we have no idea what it was like but the wounds of the cross remained and it appears from revelation that they still remain Jesus greets him with a standard Jewish greeting which would be shalom peace be with you and perhaps also to allay any fear that is sudden appearance we know that whenever supernatural things happened the people often first got scared before anything else and the point is this that the open tomb why was the tomb opened not to let jesus out but to let the people in you know whether it's the open tomb the angels the grave clothes the evidence of the wounds all were to generate faith in the disciples including the women for the resurrection now luke 24 verse 36 adds some details to this particular incident where it says that jesus uh where they gone he does seem to rebuke them a bit he says why are you troubled why do doubts rise in your minds later it says and while they still did not believe they were overjoyed and then it finally says that he ate some broiled fish in their presence so all of these things were to generate faith in them that yes he had risen it makes us realize that everything that he has spoken to them you know sort of in one year out the other or because of the trauma of the situation they just did not expect it to happen okay also remember what they were expecting and actually the kingdom that he was about to establish was so different so all of that would have factored in and we finally it says the disciples were overjoyed as is only to be expected and so in a sense physically emotionally they are transformed from fear to joy okay but jesus is here to do something deeper and so just as yesterday we said the priority of spiritual intimacy instead of physical okay which even platonic but physical this is the priority of spiritual transformation in a sense there is a physical transformation here their countenances would have changed their feelings changed their you know their whole demeanor would have changed but jesus has come to do something deeper so let's look at 21 and to 23 sorry 21 and 22 again jesus said peace be with you as the father has sent me i am sending you and with that he breathed on them and said receive the holy spirit okay so the repetition of the greeting is with reference for what he is about to say you know so don't be alarmed or don't be intimidated by what i am about to say and what he does is he gives them a commission and this is really as much part of the great commission as matthew 28 we always talk of matthew 28 19 to 20 you know go into all the world and make disciples of all nations teaching them and baptizing them but here we have a much more concise and in one sense even broader commission as the father has sent me i have sent you that's our commission what did the father send jesus for he sends us for that okay so a number of the commentaries were saying that this is only for the 11 but i believe and it seems to be the case when you look at the rest of the bible that it was for the it is for the whole church all the you in this are, are plural by the way they are not singular okay we are to carry on jesus's ministry what the father sent him to do and really the most basic description of what the father sent him to do is this to seek and to save the lost no in in the story of uh, zacchaeus jesus says the son of man came to seek and save the lost i think that out of all the things we say jesus came for that is the most 
succinct and most profound uh, description of why he came of course we can look at luke chapter 4 the spirit of the lord is upon me to to preach good news to the poor you know heal the broken hearted there are so many different passages we can look at but seek and save the lost i think is the heart of the matter okay and then he says he breathed on them and said receive the holy spirit then what happened at pentecost we'll look at that later but when he breathed the holy spirit upon them or into them we don't know for sure he is mirroring the process of genesis 2 verse 7 where god made adam and then breathed the holy spirit into him okay what is he saying that's what this whole thing i'm talking about spiritual transformation creating something new in the spiritual realm that's what jesus was maybe showing doing prophesying for what was going to happen a bit later he received the holy spirit the action may also have been paralleling the story of the dry bones in ezekiel 37 where the spirit breathes life bringing the dead things to life okay so things which are dead things which are old maybe and of course we can see that about the disciples the state that they were in at that time and jesus breathes new life jesus brings dead things to life whether it's happening or starting there and then would reach its fulfillment at the day of pentecost because jesus says wait till you receive power from on high okay so he begins a work here but in the process of that he is also giving them that commission which would be true for the whole church jesus was doing a work of spiritual transformation in his disciples and and we we will see later it was not a one it was not an immediate thing because after this they went fishing so obviously it was not like immediate and they they were now all in again there were still doubts there were still fears all of that was still happening and then verse 23 if you forgive anyone sins their sins are forgiven if you do not forgive them they are not forgiven and if this verse is not taken in the context of the commission it it gets misused to being something specific and unique for the disciples and then it went to be for only priests and that's how confession and forgiveness and all of that came about okay but in the context of this whole thing which is as the father has sent me i am sending you receive the holy spirit if you forgive anyone sins if you look at that it's all part of this commission so let me tell you what that means okay so jesus knows that the disciples expectations are still earth bound we know that no acts chapter 1 verse 6 lord when are you going to restore the kingdom to israel they still talking about that okay he knows that a spirit filled disciples can get focused on power signs and wonders the spectacular just like you and me no so he focuses on forgiveness of sins as their primary responsibility that when they're spirit filled as they're spirit filled their primary responsibility is to focus on the ministry of the forgiveness of sin then i'll explain that again a little later so on grace not condemnation on mercy not judgment on love not fear on reconciliation not separation on entry into the kingdom rather than building an independent kingdom of israel for israel okay if they had had and focused on just the power of the spirit it's so easy to go into condemnation judgment ruling through fear exclusivity all of that but when it's about forgiveness and to be told that the filling of the spirit is for that purpose then the whole nature of what you do changes okay he is preparing them for the age of the spirit when they are to use his power to serve people's need for salvation not lord it over them as proud leaders of the church and we've seen it happening in the church 
so often that somebody if somebody is powerful in the spirit it's so easy to get proud or even powerful in intellect it's so easy to get proud but the ministry is of bringing people um serving people with their need for salvation and at the heart of the matter salvation is forgiveness of sins and therefore you know because the primary task of the spirit is what he will come to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment conviction that leads to repentance that leads to forgiveness this is also the primary mission of the church of you and me the spiritual transformation of men and women jesus breathed into them jesus wanted to spiritually transform them because their mission was to bring spiritual transformation to men and women to nations which is what when we talk about revival that's what we're speaking about you know a spiritual transformation look at luke 24 46 to 47 okay jesus told them this is what is written the christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and what will be preached and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations this is the heart of the gospel message repentance and forgiveness of sins and so when he says receive the holy spirit he says it's about forgiveness about releasing and not releasing also i'll just give you one example here okay barnes writes this it was not authority to forgive individuals but to establish in all the churches the terms and conditions on which men might be pardoned with the promise that god would confirm all that they taught that all might have assurance of forgiveness who would comply with those terms what are those terms their belief those terms are not doing good deeds and that those who did not comply should not be forgiven but that their sins should be retained barclay writes it is the great privilege of the church to convey the message of god's forgiveness to men and that's what jesus does in this this uh, iteration shall i say of the great commission that you are preaching forgiveness you know it's a wonderful message but it's a catch 22 situation because in order to preach forgiveness you have to also talk about sins and that is of course where people struggle the moment you bring up sin you are condemning you know and i don't know i mean that that is a sad reality and we therefore hesitate to speak about the fact that sins are sins but until you say sin is sin you can't talk about forgiveness so we talk about love and we stop over there some of you got to find a way to reach people's need for forgiveness which is there inside but unfortunately the moment we say sin there's a problem Jesus is focusing on the priority of spiritual transformation which he does in the disciples and then through them. Jesus is building a spirit-filled, spirit-transformed and spirit-empowered church. Okay, spirit-filled, spirit-transformed and spirit-empowered church in order to carry out the most fundamental purpose for which the Father sent him to seek and save the lost. It is why he continues to fill and transform and empower us with the spirit. the world is waiting hungering thirsting desperate for the spiritual transformation and i pray holy spirit even this morning for each one here for highway as a church that you will continue to fill us to transform us and to empower us and give us your wisdom give us your discernment and i think most of all give us your boldness to preach repentance and forgiveness to reach out to seek and save the lost there's so many around us lord to help us we pray
even as a father, even as you send us out as a father sent you, let us do your work as you did it. In your name we pray. Amen.